This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Demons in the night. That's our topic this week, straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. You have blessed us with your support during our first year in ministry. You literally make it possible for us to do what we do. And so as we prepare to head into a new year, we want to return the blessing to you. Through January, we've prepared a number of special offers at the Gilbert House store, and we're featuring The Red Wing Saga, Sharon's wonderful series of supernatural thrillers that teaches spiritual warfare through masterful storytelling with fascinating historical mysteries as the backdrop. Now, all eight novels in The Red Wing Saga, a $160 value, can be yours for just $110, a savings of $50. You'll also find the Derek Gilbert Collection, all five of my nonfiction books, a $100 value for just $70. Those are just two of the special offers available through January at our online store. You'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash store. And as always, we thank you for your prayers and your support. All of us have experienced bad dreams, but sometimes they're more real than at other times, so real that you would insist that these are things that actually happen to you in the physical realm. How, what, how do we process this? Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining us, and, and by the way, thank you for uh, subscribing wherever you're listening, whether it's YouTube, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gilbert House. Click the link to subscribe. Click for notifications. You'll get uh, noticed or a, a notice every time we uh, put something up. But uh, as a backup, we highly recommend you uh, get our free app, which uh, is available for iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle, Fire Phones and Tablets, and Roku and Apple TV that bypasses the gatekeepers of big tech, just in case they go back into our archives 10 years and find something that we said then that they take offense to now. That uh, has already happened. We got a strike on our channel for something I said more than 18 months ago, so bypass that, protect yourself, get our free app, gilberthouse.org slash app. Our guest this week was a recent guest here, but she's getting a lot of attention for a book that sheds some light on things that go bump in the night. And we're not talking about prowlers in the house. We're talking about intruders from the supernatural realm. This book is highly recommended, published by Ellie Marzulli's Spiral of Life Publishing. You can find her online at vickyjoyanderson.com. The book, They Only Come Out at Night, a detailed look, exposing the dark weapon of sleep paralysis. Um, we welcome back to the program, Vicky Joy Anderson. Vicki, we had such a good response to your previous program that had to have you back on, but I um, want to clarify something because I've been using two terms interchangeably and I want to see if I'm uh, doing this right or maybe misleading people. Sleep paralysis and night terrors, I've been using them to refer to the same phenomenon. Um, is that accurate or is there is there a difference between the two? Yeah, that's a great question, Derek. I'm glad you brought that up. It would seem that they would be because sleep paralysis happens at night and it's terrifying, so it would be a sleep terror, right? But there is technically a difference between the two. And I'm just going to speak in sweeping generalizations here. Uh, People will need to do their own research. But the way you can tell the difference is a child that has sleep paralysis, you're probably not going to hear about it until the next morning. Because when you have sleep paralysis, you can't scream, you can't move. And so you're tech, you're you're typically not thrashing around or screaming. If you're within vicinity of the of, of the child's room, you might be able to hear some sort of moaning or an attempt to talk, but it's gonna just sound like regular people that are kind of talking in their sleep and it's not gonna seem very alarming unless you really know what you're looking for. Sleep terror, uh, um, night terrors on the other hand, you are gonna see a child thrashing about their bed and screaming and Make, waking the whole household up, making horrible screaming noises. And uh, they're typically very difficult to wake up if you shake them awake, uh, if you can even get them to wake up. When they, when they do wake up, they're in a terrified state, and they're usually, they can be violent, they can continue to slap. And then ironically, the next day, even after all of that commotion, you can ask the child, like, did you have bad dreams last night? And they'll say no. They'll have no real clear memory that anything happened. Whereas with someone who had sleep paralysis, they're not thrashing and screaming and calling for help. But the next day, they can pretty clearly tell you every detail of what happened. They have a memory of it. Hmm. I'm, I'm glad you bring up children because this is one of the comments that we received after our previous program um, regarded parents whose children are, are going through night terrors. And, and you mentioned this, in fact, in, uh, I think, uh, y- your book, They Only Come Out at Night, uh, you, or rather, you mentioned a character who I refer to in my book, um, 
the uh, the day the Earth stands still. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, who was the horror fiction author from about a hundred years ago, created the Cthulhu mythos. If people are familiar with that, as a child. He endured night terrors about the age of six. He remembered later for about an entire year. He was terrified of going to bed at night because he had these horrific dreams of these, these black rubbery creatures with bat like wings and no facial features that would carry him off every night to this, uh, this terrifying land. It, he wrote about them later, in fact, included those characters that he called night gaunts in some of his fiction. Didn't know what he, he, he professed to be, or at least publicly claimed that he was an atheist, but he sure drew on a lot of the uh, theo- theosophic teachings of uh, Madame Blavatsky and the uh, Telemic teachings of Aleister Crowley for his fiction. So I, I don't know. But this is something that uh, inspired the fiction of Lovecraft, which has really been influential, a lot more influential on our culture than most people realize. Uh, for parents with children who are enduring this kind of thing, whether it's night terrors or sleep paralysis... Um, what do, what do parents do? How do how do we deal with it? Yeah, it's a complex it's a complex question, Derek, and it does it does also matter how what the, like the age of the child because you can deal with it differently as they're if they're older. But the the biggest issue is that the child might not communicate to the parent that this is going on, and and that's the hardest because that's where you need discernment because. In this case, if they're not coming to you and telling you, I had a bad dream last night, and that's that's the language they're going to use. The average three-year-old isn't going to say, you know, I had sleep paralysis or I something demonic happened. They're going to say, I had a bad dream. And so you have to notice things like if your three-year-old is saying, I had a bad dream, pretty much more frequently than usual, or they start having behaviors at bedtime because they don't want to go to bed or they keep stalling. And I mean, I know to a degree all kids do that. So you have to look for multiple signs at, you know, is there a change of behavior? Is there high anxiety as it's bedtime? Or are there more fights or arguments or is there hysteria or is there a lot of talk about bad dreams or are they, you know, you have to kind of pray and look for the signs. And I'm very specifically saying three years old, Derek, because Myself, as well as many people who have written to me and some people I've had a chance to talk to, they are sharing that a lot of these people that have had sleep paralysis for 20, 30, 40 years, this habitual, continual, all through their life kind of sleep paralysis, it starts around three years old. And we can delve into some of the doors that open that up because obviously a child isn't dabbling with a Ouija board and, you know, (laughs) doing things that typically open doors. But the, the frightening thing about it beginning that early, Derek, is that, again, you don't really have a child that can communicate fully what's going on. And what's scary about that kind of sleep paralysis is it very often is a grooming process. You know, we're talking a lot now about the grooming that's going on in the public schools and the CSE, the Comprehensive Sex Education, and just how it's this grooming process and how There's certain social media sites that are really just designed to groom children. Mm -hmm. And and just so everyone is clear, I'm talking sexual grooming, sexual perversion, that type of thing. And so we've got these um, social media sites that are just teeming with these groomers. And, um, And so what I'm starting to discover is I'm starting to talk to people who say this kind of stuff started when I was three years old and it became over the course all the way through childhood and adolescence and in my teen years, it was a very slow, very subtle sexual grooming. Um, and this, this could involve the dreams. Um, I'll just, I'll put this delicately for your audience. A lot of these children at a very young age would wake up to discover themselves exploring their bodies Mm -hmm. and uh, they had an awakening of a sort because Mm -hmm. that's something that they had never done before. And then it, it becomes twisted into the sleep paralysis process becomes twisted into a, a waking fantasy life that's then fueled during the sleep paralysis experiences. Um, And several of these people have told me 
that in adulthood, they either came out as homosexual and lived in that lifestyle 10, 15, 20 years until they found Christ. Uh, or um, some of the men will tell me that it it created addictions and relationship issues and and problems like that. And so what the parent is then dealing with is all of a sudden they've got a 17, 18, 19, 20 year old who was going to Sunday school and in the choir and everything was going great. And they went to Bible college. And then all of a sudden this comes out of nowhere. Mm. And it really, in many cases, isn't coming out of nowhere in some of those cases. So it's really important as parents, I think, that the two pieces of advice I would give, and I just want to clarify because I'm not a parent and I, I feel very uncomfortable giving parental advice, especially in this day and age where things are not the same as when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to clarify that I'm I'm coming from the perspective of 40 plus years of experience of having sleep paralysis and talking to other people who have had the same experience. That the the two pieces of advice that I would give is if your child is coming to you and frequently talking to you about bad dreams, and if they can be explicit in that detail, don't do the, it was just a dream. Don't write them off because what happens then is they'll retreat into themselves. They'll, you'll send the message, mom and dad are not interested in this. It's just a dream. Hmm. And they will then become further isolated and they will they will go through this process by themselves and let me tell you something very fascinating one of the guys that i was talking to and he was one of them who was raised in a very godly rural home out you know where he would not have been exposed to anything worldly like that and he lived the homosexual lifestyle for quite a while until he found christ i asked him because this began at at like three four years old i asked him did you have a concept at three or four years old being raised in a Christian home that 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 what you were doing in those fantasies was wrong or bad or dirty or sinful? And he said, none of those things, but I knew it was secret. Mm. And this, again, is grooming language. You know, this is a secret. This is our little secret. Don't tell mom and dad. This is a secret because you're special. It's the same stuff. So... When your child is coming to you and it's important enough of a detail for them to bring it up at the breakfast table, just pay attention to it. And the the second thing that I would caution is don't pay too much attention to it in front of them. You know, there's certain things that you need to dialogue with your spouse or with your prayer group. Um, when you sit and ask your child a million curious questions that can form almost an obsession or a distraction for both the parents and the children where they become fascinated with this and then they're getting slowly lured in by it. And then um, the more attention these entities get, then the more they like to be more overt and then there's more to talk about. And then they're, 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 it's kind of almost fueling this negative obsession with it that can actually make the the things get worse. So I'm sort of talking out of two sides of my mouth here, and it, it really takes discernment because you don't want to write them off and ignore them and not pay attention to it at all, but you don't want to be doing all of your adult conversating about it with your three, four, five, six-year-old. Mm. Uh, because especially if you're dealing with an average child who loves attention from mom and dad, if they see mom and dad get really animated when I talk about this, they could start really seeking more of those experiences out simply because they love the way mom and dad light up or get get sure. upset or get concerned when they talk about it. So it really requires discernment on behalf of the Holy Spirit to pay attention to your kids. And when you sense something is wrong, you take it to prayer and you ask the Holy Spirit for a trajectory of how you handle that. Yeah, it's like anything else. I mean, kids are really, really sensitive and they pick up on nonverbal cues a lot faster and a lot more discerningly than, than we as parents realize. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's like the tightrope that we walk as Christians. We don't want to see a, a demon behind every bush, as it were. Uh, you know, the, the demon of vanilla ice cream is making me fat. 
<laughs> but on the other hand, we don't want to discount the the influence of the spirit realm on our our daily lives. As I mean, Paul made it clear: we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against cosmic rulers over this present darkness. I mean, he's not talking about you know Democrats there. He's, t- he's talking right. about, <laughs> and and I say that jokingly because you can apply this regardless of what political party you are, wherever you are on planet Earth. He's not talking about people who have a different political persuasion. He's talking about spirits in the spirit realm, and we have been de sensitized to that in in the modern world. I, I did an interview a few years ago with Doug Overmeyer, who's written about his ministry is called Sears C, uh, Sears C.com his book, uh, peace in your house. I believe it's the title. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. So people can go back and listen to it. It's about how to cleanse your home from, uh, malevolent spiritual influences. He told me that, and the reason Doug founded this ministry is because his daughter, uh, one of his daughters, was seeing things in 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 the waking world that Doug and his wife could not see, and rather than dismiss her entirely, they began to realize, wait a minute, she, there are people out there who who have that gift, and it's not all demonic. I mean, uh, so in a Christian household, how do you process this when your child is seeing into the spirit realm? But he he realized at one point he he confessed to a fascination with a very popular genre of entertainment right now zombie films zombie television series you know The Walking Dead The Waking Dead and you know they've what, however many spinoffs that series has has uh, spawned here in recent years I I don't get the fascination with it but they're making money <laughs> D- Doug realized that he had to give that up. And repent of it because they were, even though they were in a Christian home, praying against things, realizing that there is a supernatural realm that influences our world, that perhaps this was a gateway or a doorway that the spirit realm was using. So to my question, Vicki, what can we as adults do in terms of the entertainment we consume or whatever th- thoughts that we harbor that can influence our children? Absolutely. This is such a fantastic question, and it's so important. So, Derek, I want to talk about a controversial, outdated, outmoded <laughs> concept, and that's biblical headship, um, whether <laughs> whether we like it or not. Oh, the patriarchy. Oh, I see. <laughs> Here go all your yeah, subscribers, yeah. Derek. I'll tread lightly. <laughs> uh, uh, the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not, or whether we respect it or not, the spirit realm is excruciatingly legalistic. And Mm. if they can get you on a legal footnote that you don't know about, if something has fallen out of our realm of knowledge, they will love to trick you on it. And a lot of people like to argue with me on this point, and they say, well, no, they can't trick you because that violates the free will. But the very first example we have in in Genesis with the serpent, he duped them. Mm-hmm. He tricked them. And and God didn't come then to Adam and Eve and say, well, okay, since that was not fair, he, he hit below the belt there, I'm going to hit my cosmic reset button, and that one doesn't count because you were tricked. Adam and Eve were held accountable, and greatly so, for, for that rebellion. And so these things are all about trickery. And so whether you like it or not, whether it triggers you or not, the spirit realm understands that the head of the house is their way in. Mm. And especially if you're talking about the children, uh, if there is a hole in the umbrella, okay, if, if, the, if, the, if the head of the household is the umbrella that is, is spread out over this whole house so that when it rains, the family doesn't get wet, if there's holes in that umbrella, Uh, there is potentially going to be openings. And here's what the spirit realm loves to do. They will find their opening through the head of the household, Mm. but they're not interested in attacking the head of the household always. They're bullies. What do bullies do? They pick on the smallest kid in the class because it's the one that can make him look tough. It's the one he knows he can beat up. So what happens a lot, and it's tragic, Derek, you've got a Christian man, he's got an addiction. Nobody knows about it. Nobody finds out about it. This goes on for years, and the guy thinks, this is awesome. 
nobody is ever going to find this out. Yeah, yeah. The internet has really made that easy. Yes. So nobody finds out. And the man starts to foolishly believe, I'm getting away with this. Mm -hmm. There's no consequences to this. My wife doesn't know. It's, It's not affecting our marriage. Everything's great. God's not retaliating and punishing me by taking away my job or making me, I, I'm getting away with this. No, you are not. Because when you let these things into your home, they're going to go for the weakest link. They're going to go for the, the easiest person to fool. And you might not know over these formative years for 10, 15 years as you're in your basement getting away with all this, you don't know what these diabolical groomers are doing to your innocent little kids in their sleep. And they might not communicate it to you. And they might not ever tell you. And they also might not be showing the signs. The same way you're getting away with your sin, the the, the entities are getting away with it too because they're dealing with someone who can't communicate what's going on, doesn't understand the complexities of the spirit realm, doesn't understand it's in danger, especially when everything that they're hearing from the adults and from their teachers and from film and movies and music is that it's just a dream. And so there's no consequences to a dream. You can do whatever you want in a dream because there's no consequences. Mm. But when your dreams are transporting you to a spiritual realm and these characters that are showing up in your dreams aren't just static one-dimensional visualizations like on a television screen. These are actual entities and the interactions that you are participating in in these dreams are in fact real then all of the consequences of of that will will you will take that into the physical realm with you and this isn't just children let's talk about puberty let's talk about boys let's talk about let's talk about some of those dreams nobody wants to talk about because they're mm-hmm. too embarrassing uh and i'm not saying that in every single case that's an astral or a sleep paralysis experience but in many cases and in some cases uh if you're prone to these night visions and these these astral projections you you need to really be aware of what you're doing and what you're saying in these dreams and you need to learn how to control that you need to take the scripture that you've memorized and the spiritual warfare tactics and the taking every thought captive everything that you would do in your waking hours you need to take that war- warfare into your dream life as well because you'll find even in your dreams when these temptations come upon you, if you if you call on the name of Jesus in your dreams, that dream stops. So there's something more going on here. And so I think that we need to get to the place where we're at least willing to consider the fact that just like we see in the scriptures with Nebuchadnezzar and, and various people, sometimes these dreams are far more than just nocturnal defraggings. Hmm. This is really, and you know, viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube or our app, you, you can see the expression on my face, ra- rather somber, because you know I'm thinking back over my own life. We men are visual creatures, and so uh, we can be drawn into things very easily. There's certain websites I go to for for news. Uh, I'll mention one, the Daily Mail in the UK, for example, which does a better job of. Um, investigative reporting here on politics in the U.S. and any of the uh, corporate media sites here in the U.S. But the right-hand sidebar of their website is, mm. you know, Kim Kardashian wearing her bikini or whatever. And, and so, you know, I, I want the news aspect of it. I don't want to see these, you know, starlets who are famous for being famous because I know what kind of destructive feedback loop that can that can create. Mm. Um, absolutely and and the enemy will use this and what i find really disturbing about this is that by convincing us men and i've heard you know friends of mine over the years say this well you can look as long as you you can look at the menu as long as you don't order anything you know (laughs) you can look as long as you don't touch but that's not what jesus said that looking and lusting is adultery it's not like adultery it is adultery it is you know, a a sin. There's no, there's no question about it. Um, and, and so by using that 
weakness in, in us men. They are getting access to our children or whomever might be under our spiritual protection in our household. They've pierced our armor. They've, they've put a hole in the umbrella, and now the rain is hitting the, these, these children. And the way you put this, a spiritual grooming. Our children, our grandchildren are being groomed supernaturally. And I, I don't think we can emphasize that enough. This is really disturbing. It's bad enough that this is happening, say, on TikTok. But if this is happening underneath our roofs, because we men are not putting up our armor, putting on, <laughs> this is really unconscionable. Yeah, it, it's really frightening. It It is pandemic. You know, we, we can talk about pandemics, but Derek, since since this book came out and people have been corresponding with me and we've done some surveys and things, this this sleep paralysis phenomenon is more common than the common cold. And I'm not joking. Hmm. And I'll give you one of the little stats. We we did a survey, a, a, a pre-book release survey, and about 250 people responded to this survey. So it's a small smattering of people. Not everyone in the, the survey were born again Christians at all. So it was a it was really a you know eclectic group of of people, men and women of different ages all over the country. And one of the questions was, you know, I've experienced sleep paralysis never once or twice, five or six times, whatever. And the last one was my entire life. Mm. And I expected honestly one percent less, two percent maybe tops. It was just under 20% of, of these people, this, this small group. And so this is far more common than we think. And another thing I want to add as a little add-on, we talk a lot about men. Men are always kind of getting the, you know, the, all the credit for, for the lust and, and the dreams like that. But one thing that I'm finding with the women who talk to me, the women who have had the sleep paralysis of the sexual nature – very clever, Derek. They have very explicit dreams, but the entity that is appearing to them is in the form of their husband. Oh, well, you're, you're, Sharon has gone public about this. In fact, she went viral by talking about this on the Jim Baker show a year ago Wow! Um, and was mocked. I mean, she showed up in some of those red tops over in the UK. Oh, look at this crazy fundamentalist Christian lady. Who, this, this was in the context of discussing the uh, alien abductee and contactee phenomenon, which is very, very similar. It's the same very. sort of thing. In fact, uh, this is why the late Harvard psychologist, Dr. John Mack, in in identifying key aspects of the abductee phenomenon and the SRA phenomenon, satanic ritual abuse, connected the two. But I think if he had gone and looked at sleep paralysis, he would have found that that fit right into that paradigm so Sharon told this story, which she discussed in the past. In fact, she mentioned it on Skywatch TV years ago. Didn't get that much attention because the atheists are all looking at Jim Baker to try to show him out, you know, show him up. And, uh, sure. but yeah, this is, this is exactly what Sharon experienced more than 15 years ago, went through a series of experiences where this entity appeared as me. And, mm -hmm. you know, she could see me in the bed, but this other entity, like sitting up out of my body, like some, uh, you know, horror film. Um, so yeah, this is something that, uh, we've got some. Uh, personal experience with yeah yeah absolutely because again you know it's just a dream and oh i had this wonderful dream about my husband and and it's this it's so innocent so so then what happens you don't question it so then you don't do the work of the cleansing when you wake up you mm -hmm. don't do the prayers and the the rebuking and the repenting you don't you don't do any of the cleanup afterwards because you're like well hey I just had a dream about my husband last night it was really sweet you know yeah so and to be um, clear she did recognize what was going on and she when she was able to you know free herself from the paralysis by thinking the name of Jesus she was able to rebuke it in the name of Jesus but this happened several times and like I said this is past history where it is not to come back again uh, more than fifteen years now but. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, God bless her because she recognized what was happening, but I could see somebody without this understanding with this, this worldview, yeah, uh, knowing absolutely. that this is something that's going on would not recognize it for what it was. Absolutely. They're, it, they're so clever. And I mean, even just in film, a lot of times, you know, you'll get the classic horror movies, you know, and it, so many times there's a plot line where they move into a new house and the child has an invisible friend 
right? right? Mm-hmm. And and so it's appearing in a form that is non-threatening. And that is what they're good at doing. That's why, you know, for some people, if a demon with red glowing eyes showed up at the end of their bed, they'd scream, they'd call it the name of Jesus. But if it's grandma, right, right. then it's not threatening. If it's if it's my husband, it's not threatening. If it's a little child that wants to play with me and is super nice to me, it's non-threatening. And so we know that these wolves can dress up like sheep. We know that Satan parades like an angel of light. And so uh, we, we have to understand that there's a huge difference between a spiritual being, namely Jesus, who says, I am light and I am love, and beings that radiate love and light. And when when people are out there talking about spreading love and light, this is a highly new age philosophy. Right, light workers, it, yeah. Yeah, and, and so they are actually, in some cases, you know, like, you know, with Reiki and things, they're actually throwing symbols at you, you know, that love and light, they're, they're, it sounds so biblical because God says God is light and God is love. And so it sounds so biblical. And, but, you know, if someone says like, hey, sending love and light your way, say, I rebuke that. Mm -hmm, (laughs) I mm -hmm. I do not receive that. That is not biblical language. And so these things come to us packaged in our terminology, in our doctrine, they come packaged in our conceptions of friends and family and our religious concepts of God, but they are they are diabolical. They they are in costumes uh, where we cannot readily recognize them without discernment. Mm. Sharon has drawn on that experience to uh, try to illustrate that in her Red Wing saga, where there are some encounters by main characters with uh, people they they know and love, and it becomes clear that this person is not who they appear to be. Um, it 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 is uh, distressing to think um, that my lack of understanding early in our marriage probably contributed to what uh, Sharon was going through. Hmm. Um, as Sharon will tell you, when we first met, I was still, the Holy Spirit was working on me, but I hadn't quite caught up yet to where she was. I was arguing with her debate team captain qualified for state tournament twice in, in Illinois in my junior and senior year of high school that, uh, in, in discussing Darwinian evolution, I was arguing there was no conflict with, uh, the, the idea of a fall from grace, uh, sin and redemption, which, uh, of course is if there's no fall, there's no need for a, a savior. And if, if he is saving us anyway, it's, Oh, wow. logically inconsistent. So I've, I've come a long way since then, but you know, that's all on the Holy spirit. That's not me and, and me being really smart. Um, but early in our marriage, that's where I was. I had no understanding of this conversation we're having now. Had I had this back in 1997 or eight would have thought, okay, <laughs> clearly what right. head trauma, uh, what, what's, you know, what's, what's going on with him that he's, that he's gone crazy. But I've encountered too many people like you, like Tom Dunn, like Russ Isdar, uh, many others in deliverance who, are rational, productive people for me to discount it anymore, um, and I, I'm I'm thankful I'm not called to that line of work because that's well, it's pretty scary. <laughs> Greater is He that is in us than He that's in the world. I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek, but th- th- this is a thing that that I think we as as men especially, because the biblical structure of the family places us at the head of the household as the protectors, as the sheepdogs guarding the fold, if you will. And we're raising up a generation of young men who are staying on the couch playing Xbox until they're 28, instead of stepping up and becoming men like our great grandparents had to do at the age of, you know, 16, 17, 18, uh, taking on that responsibility for themselves and for their families. And I've had to grow into this role late in life uh, and like I said, just thinking back on the early days and, and these things that Sharon experienced early on, thinking that somehow my behavior and my lack of understanding probably contributed to that is really, you know, a regret. Yeah, that's weighty. And and that's where we've lost that in our modern culture where everyone wants to be a CEO <laughs> because they think that means power. And uh, when you really 
look at the concept of headship biblically, it'd be terrible. I don't know who who would want it. <laughs> I mean, the the weight of responsibility, uh, and I mean, we even see it in Genesis where Eve took the fruit and ate of it, and Adam was really God went to Adam. What what was going on down here? You know, and 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 Genesis Adam, makes clear that Adam was with her. He was yes. with her when this happened. He did not step in and exercise what his he was supposed to step in and say, no, Eve, this is not what we're going to do. And of course, today's world feminist would say, well, that's not his that's not for him to say. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. It, it is. It yeah, was. But what if what if what if he had stepped in? And, and yeah. said, hey, buddy, talk to me like what would have happened there? You know, yeah. Um, and it's hypothetical because he he probably would have come back and tried another angle. But um, I'm really glad that you brought up the uh, concept of of ignorance. Like, if only I had known this, you know, back then. Uh, there is a really interesting concept hidden in Ephesians six twelve, which is so relevant to this conversation anyway, because these high places where all of these rulers and archons and authorities are hiding out is really the characters in many cases that we're dealing with, with whether it's SRA or it's astral projection. Um, in, in in that verse, it talks about the forces of darkness. And that word darkness in Greek is skotas, S-K-O-T-A-S, would be the English mm-hmm. phonetic version of that, skotas. And it means what we would think darkness would mean, and it kind of means sin and evil and the consequences and the fallout of those things. But it's very interesting if you if you dig into the commentaries and you look contextually in that verse and where it's seated and what it means, Skotas also carries with it an idea of human ignorance of divine things. So in other words, these entities are playing on they they aren't even playing on, they are banking on our ignorance they 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 are able to carry forth their agenda and deceive us and get away with what they're doing because we are ignorant of divine things and there's many reasons why we're ignorant some of us we we never crack a bible like it's sitting on our coffee table and it's collecting dust and so if we're not in the word we're going to be ignorant and this, there's there's many other reasons for it though too because we obviously as time moves on things fall out of our knowledge as as we're finding even in this era as we're reading books by Heiser and Tom Horn and like your books Derek I mean there are things that have fallen out of our knowledge they aren't taught in seminary anymore they're not taught in the church they're considered irrelevant they're considered boring um for whatever reason they fall out of our our vernacular and so we become ignorant. And so what happens is we have this this plane of existence that's crawling with evil entities that hate us and that are after us. And they um, they are are banking on the fact that they're going to get us in all of these loopholes because this stuff has fallen out of our knowledge. And that's really, Derek, why I'm willing to write the book that I wrote and why I'm willing to explore these things because I struggled with this and nobody has rubbed this in my face. Nobody has said this to me yet, but one of my fears was, is that I was going to get these Christians accusing me of why are you giving all this attention to the devil and you should be Mm -hmm. just talking about Jesus and we should just be preaching the gospel. And, and as someone who was raised in the church and has gone on mission trips, and I mean, my dad was a missions pastor for like 18 years, and so like I understand, we should the Great Commission is you go and you preach the gospel, mm-hmm. um, but but it also says to expose the deeds of the devil and to set captives free, and if we are in divine ignorance, and these evil entities are banking on that ignorance as a means to take us captive in schemes such as this, then there is a point where we don't have to put this in the gospel in scales and have it outweigh the gospel. 
it doesn't mean, hey, now that I've written this book, I don't preach the gospel and I don't share my faith. But at some point, somebody's got to talk about this because we've got husbands like you and we've got three-year-olds like me who were held captive by this and there were real consequences in their life or in the life of their family because we didn't know. We didn't take it seriously. We didn't understand that it was something spiritual. And we opened doors unwittingly. And sometimes these doors, these particular doors, sometimes they're really hard to close. And I'm not saying that we can't cleanse our homes of these things and that we can't get rid of these things because we can. But depending on how far down the path you get, because a lot of people, you and I, we were in a Christian environment. And so we were able to, and like Sharon was a good example. She's like, wait, I know what's going on here. Right. What if you're not raised in a Christian home? And what if you didn't go to church for the first 30 years of your life? And and what happens in those cases is that people get intrigued with this and they get entrenched and they become psychics and they become ghost hunters and they start going around at graveyards at midnight call conjuring up entities and dead spirits and and you start getting decades of that kind of stuff under your belt and there's just there's so much then to there's so many doors to close and uh so it's not that you can't close them but some people are on a journey of many years prayer mapping down to that, what was the source, what was the source? And there were so many sources and that they just have to kind of keep shutting those doors. And so somebody has got to talk about it, Derek, because Christians, you know, we have this idea, well, I'm a Christian, so Satan can't bother me. Satan can't oppress me. Satan can't make me sick. Mm -hmm. Satan can't possess me. And Satan can't read my mind. And we think that somehow we are these, you know, Teflon, you know, superheroes. And the fact is, every time we sin, we're vulnerable. And, you know, yes, we have a covering, as long as we are under that covering. But we step out underneath that covering all the time when we sin. We know better than God, and we're going to do this. And so the, this idea that because I prayed a prayer one time and went up and signed a card and got a free mug, that Satan is never going to be able to touch me, uh, that's a kind of attitude that can get us into trouble if we take it too far, because I am hearing from a lot of Christians uh, that have been tormented by this stuff. And so this is happening in the church. So when you have hundreds, if not thousands of people experiencing this who love the Lord and are walking in His steps and they are pursuing holiness, they're authentic believers, when you've got thousands of them secretly dealing with this and it's never mentioned in the church, that allows the spiritual realm to continue working covertly and continuing to bank on our human ignorance of divine things. Mm. This is why we are featuring uh, Vicki Joy Anderson's book, They Only Come Out at Night, as a special offer during the month of November. Still time for you to take advantage of this, uh, because we really want to get this in your hands. It's uh, not just a diagnosis of what the situation is, but it's uh, got prescriptions for how you can address these things and also i guess reassurance for people who are experiencing this that uh, they are not alone that this is more common than uh, than we've been taught it is something that uh, all of us have experienced probably at least once but for some people like you vicky this is a, a recurring thing that is just uh, horrific we we see in job chapter four a reference to uh, what looks like a sleep paralysis experience where uh, uh job's friend eliphaz is talking about a spirit that glides past his face in the night and uh, he can see a form but he can't make it out and it's it, it really sounds like well like the hat man experience that i had once uh, back around 1984 but this gets to the heart of who jesus is saving us from I mean, every now and then, will you? Why are you talking about the you know the Nephilim and the Rephaim all the time? Shouldn't we? T yeah, uh, we 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 do this because th this is who Jesus is saving us from these demons who are still with us, and uh, this is one aspect of their assault on us—a multi-layered attack that uh, damages the what should be the shield for the family through the head of the household, and that's why there's such an assault on the on the family structure in Western civilization. If you d divide and conquer is really what it's all about. 
when you yeah. divide the family into individual little units. I mean, I've said before, I can't tell you how often when I was in outside sales, I would stop for lunch someplace and I'd see a family during the summer months going out for a meal together, but they're all four of them sitting on their phones. You know, the family's been divided. Fathers have been rendered irrelevant, declared irrelevant by the dominant culture. And uh, thus that covering is no longer there. Which uh, absolutely, and it and it's getting stronger, Derek. Even just in the last three years, um, with the whole woke stuff going on, yep. now we have this mansplaining. Like now, if a man even speaks an opinion, he right, needs right. to be shamed and ridiculed for yeah. it. And then we have this: a man, you absolutely cannot speak whatsoever on abortion because if you can't have a baby, you how would you have an opinion on it? <laughs> but of and, course, they, they, and at the same time, they're telling us that men can have you know me- menstruate too. So it's like, exactly, wait, wait a minute, exactly. wait a minute, wait a minute. You only recognize women when it comes to uh, the practice of sacrificing a molech. All right, fine, exactly. okay, exactly. I love this. It's like uh, you can only talk about this if you're a woman, but. Who can define what a woman is? So exactly, we don't know. Be able yeah. To have a word? So uh. it's getting it's getting worse. And one thing that um, is very obvious is if the enemy can't get the man physically away from his family, if he can't physically take him out of that house through divorce or adultery or whatever, he will still take him out of that house with him present. Yep. And this is where we see the addictions and like the the video game obsession among adults. I've even seen uh these Marvel and DC movies like grown men are getting obsessed with these things to the point where they're, you know, more interested in their their collectibles than they are in spending time with their family and it's yep. just you know, and you and I, I mean, we could do a whole nother show on the spirit behind who those superheroes are and why people that are attracted to those movies aren't just fans, but they are worshippers of these yep, things. Yep, They're obsessed yep. with them. Yeah, I just did uh, a recent because, program with uh, the our Iron and Myth series with uh, Judd Burton, Brian uh, Godawa, Doug Van Dorn on the gods of Hollywood. So I'll refer viewers oh, back to that. But yes, we only scratched the surface of that. You're right. That's a, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother series. Yeah, absolutely. So... I mean, men, I mean, in the church, we've got to just um, really go to the Lord and say, I mean, I've, I've even done this um, myself, Derek. I've, things are so confusing now, and I, I will even go to the Lord in prayer often and say, am I doing a good job, like, being a biblically feminine woman? And sometimes I struggle because I am single, and when you're single, you kind of take care of yourself, and so it's, sometimes I feel like, is this being— independent and would I, would I, would I struggle then if I was married? Cause I've been used to this for so long. And so I'm constantly taking my own litmus test on that. Like God, no matter what happens in my life or what happens to this culture, I want to make sure that I am the biblical definition of a godly feminine woman. And I, I don't want the culture to subtly take me away. And so we got to do this. Men and women both have to do this. We can't lose our identity in in this chaos. Amen. Vicki, you do a regular program with Tom Dunn through the Black. Where do people follow your work, uh, that program and also your work? Yeah, so Through the Black um, is on YouTube, and uh, I think it's Through the Black 2. A lot of people have said that they've had trouble finding it, uh, Derek. So I think if you just, if you're in YouTube, if you search Through the Black, Tom Dunn, or, or if you can even just search like the names of one of our shows. So if you do through the black chaos magic, that was our first show. It Mm. it should come up and then you can get into the channel. Um, And we are on six nights a week at 11 PM Eastern. We're gluttons for punishment and we're night owls. And so, but you can also catch us in the archives, but if you catch us live, we have an amazing chat. Our, the people in our chat are so awesome. You can get me at vickyjoyanderson.com. Um, and my, my book, they only come out at night is typically available on lamarzuli.net, but this month you can get them through. Yes. Gilberthouse.org. Yes. At a special price, uh, LA very gracious in allowing us to, uh, offer the book and uh, we're happy to do it as a part of a special offer. Uh, check the show notes, vftv.net, YouTube, wherever you're watching or listening, because I'll put links to the, through the black YouTube channel and Vicky's awesome. website as well. And, uh, Vicky, yes, we will definitely have you back because this is solid information that uh, is sorely lacking in the church today. Thanks again for your work and for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Derek.
Check our show notes wherever you're checking out the podcast is VFTB.net, which is, of course, our global hub or uh, anywhere else online. YouTube, uh, of course, but uh, also uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, wherever fine podcasts are sold. And uh, you'll find in the notes a link to Vicki Anderson's website and, of course, a link to her book. They only come out at night, which I will remind you is uh, a special this month in the Gilbert House store um, because we believe that this book is valuable information. All of us have experienced something like this at least once, but for some people, it is a recurring event. If you know someone like that, if you're going through this yourself, there are answers. We as Christians have the guidebook, as our friend L.A. Marzulli calls it, the guidebook to the supernatural. We just need to remember, speaking to myself here, to consult it more frequently when dealing with problems like this. So, uh, VickiJoyAnderson.com, the website, and uh, we encourage you to follow her work and her writing. Coming up, we've got uh, another virtual conference. Uh, by the way, Skywatch TV's virtual conference continues. You can sign up through February 4th, and I've been giving bad information in the run-up to the conference, and uh, this is on me. I've been saying it was 90 days you had access from November 4th when the conference launched through February 4th. Actually, you can sign up for the conference through February 4th, and you get 90 days access from the day you sign up. So if you sign up late after the actual launch date of the conference, you're not penalized. So take advantage of this because you get two dozen presentations, mine on the uh, geography of um, Jesus' ministry, exposing the valley of the shadow of death. Psalm 23, we've all heard about that, the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of, well, it's, it's a literal place. It's a literal place. The clues have been there in the Bible all along. We're just now finding out where it is and what it refers to. That's just one of two dozen presentations, plus the six feature-length documentaries from Skywatch Films. You get access to all of those for 90 days from the day you sign up, and you get instant access because it's available right now at DefenderConference.com. DefenderConference.com. If you uh, had signed up for the uh, Advanced Supernatural Warfare training course, uh, which featured Vicki Joy Anderson, an excellent presentation on sleep paralysis, uh, I gave a talk on, um, well, similar to the one for the Skywatch TV conference, a little different, Not try not to do the same thing too often, but it's a similar topic, the uh, literal war against death. Mine was uh, on the origin of demons, where they come from, what do we know about them? So uh, this this is being produced by Hear the Watchman into a training course. The presentations will be enhanced with uh, workbooks that summarize the presentations. So you can follow along in these workbooks, use them for a Bible study, Sunday school class, what have you. Find out more at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com, where they're also going to be putting together a virtual conference for January. I've been in touch with Mike Kerr about that, or he's been in touch with me about that, rather. And uh, I've agreed to put together a talk for that. More details as that becomes available. Our Skywatch uh, TV tour of Israel coming up in March, March 19th through 30th. We'll be there alongside uh, Rabbi Zev Porat. Uh, that's... Um, We've got two full buses. I know they're trying to make reservations now. So if you're interested in in going along with us to Israel, you really need to sign up right away for a couple of reasons. Hotel rooms are going quick as uh, tourism gets back to normal levels in uh, Israel, plus the backlog of people who wanted to go the last couple of years and couldn't make it. We, uh, well, we're going back for the first time in four years. So a lot of other people like us who are Heading to Israel now, now that all the travel restrictions have been dropped, and if you're interested in going, sign up quick and make sure you've got a valid passport because uh, the State Department's got a backlog of passport applications to work through thanks to the COVID uh, lockdowns. Um, We are actually going out a few days early, and we'll be uh, on the ground with Zev Porat and uh, Aaron Lipkin visiting some sites that are on the tour and some that are not on the tour to put together a... uh, well, what we call a travelogumentary, a phrase we borrowed from Aaron Judkins, on, uh, well, the f- subject of our forthcoming book called The Gates of Hell. And uh, we're looking forward to that. 
Details still forthcoming on our tour of Turkey. We're planning to be there next October. A lot depends on what happens between Russia and Ukraine, because that Black Sea region is um, just a little tense at the moment, so we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, Meanwhile, if you get a spare moment, uh, thank you, by the way, for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen to this podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Speaker Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Uh, If you get a spare moment, uh, we'd appreciate a review. Thank you. Um, Our announcer, D.C. Good, and a view from the bunkers of production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0, international license. Everything's up to date here south of Kansas City, and uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Mm -hmm.